Okay, I think it's there now. Okay. There it is. Okay. Um, all right. So chapter 12, unsupervised learning. Um, so this is sort of the, I don't know if, if inverse is the word, but it's maybe the opposite of what we've covered in the previous chapters. Um, and we still have a set of features and observations, um, but there's really no, there's no right answer. There's no accuracy. Um, so it's a more of a exploratory analysis tool. Um, so, um, right. So that we're not interested in, in, we're not trying to predict anything because there's no right answer. There's no response variable here, right? So we're we're more trying to understand the underlying signal and pattern in the data set. Um, and the two ways that the book goes through it is principal component analysis and clustering. Um, they sort of go into this at the end of the chapter, but I think it makes sense to say at the beginning. I think of PCA as, as a continuous data approach of condensing multiple continuous variables into fewer that, that have higher signal. Um, and then clustering is, is identifying subgroups in the data set. Um, so it's assigning observations to some category or some group that doesn't exist in the real world. Um, but you're asking the, the code to put them in clusters um, based on the patterns that, that it sees. Um, so we've already done PCA for regression. So that a lot of the, that math has been established. Um, again, it's a way of extracting signal from the noise if you have um, high dimensionality. Uh, but oftentimes um, you can do unsupervised, unsupervised learning at the beginning of a data science project for exploratory data analysis or EDA. Um, but again, there's no, there's no right answer. There's no way to check your work. Um, you can technically do a holdout set and see how well the, the clustering um, reflects in the holdout set. But again, these, these approaches are, are vulnerable to change if the data changes. So that's kind of an iffy thing, iffy approach. Um, so they go through some examples here, but we'll skip to PCA. So principal component analysis, um, if you have a lot of variables, a lot of continuous variables, you can use PCA to extract the signal or condense the signal down into a smaller number of variables. So, so you're going from a larger feature space to a smaller feature space and trying to retain as much of the signal or variance as possible. Um, so in, in as part of the output of PCA, you're actually creating new variables in your matrix. So if you have you know, 10 columns of metrics, um, and then you do PCA on them, you'll get more columns because you're adding on those principal components. Um, so again, we're going from high dimensionality to low dimensionality. Um, and we're trying to capture as much of that information as possible. Um, so it's, it's about finding the the representations of the data that are most interesting, and they define inter interesting as as the amount that the observations vary along each dimension. Because if you create new dimensions where there's no variance among the observations, then that that new dimension doesn't tell you anything about the data. Um, so first thing you do is scale the the uh, input data, um, otherwise that can throw off the amount that the that the PCA thinks that the, that the it, it can skew the amount of variance that's being 
um, used in the in the calculation. So you you rescale all your variables in the matrix to have a mean of zero, um, and you get loadings, you get scores. Um, if you want to get into the really deep math of it, you can talk about eigenvectors. Um, but really, it's a, it's about creating these elements that are directions along the, in in the future space, right? Um, and and the the, the another big idea here is that the principal components are uncorrelated with each, with each other. So even if the input data is highly correlated, the the principal components that are calculated on those are not correlated with the other principal components. So they're orthogonal. Um, and that's part of maximizing that variance. Right, orthogonal. So if you go to the, um, if we skip down to this, this chart here, they, they do PCA on the USARS data. Um, so we have each observation of the state and you have columns representing the various counts of or the per capita rates of crime and then the, the, the percentage of the population that lives in an urban center. Um, and the principal components, for the first two are on the X and Y axis here. And we can see that the it, it's overlaying the original columns on top of the principal components with the labels on the states. So the um, the first principal component is more about the, the about the crime types, about the per capita rates uh, per capita rates of those crimes. Um, and the second principal component is more about the urban population. Um, so this is again going back to that exploratory data analysis step. This is pretty key to understanding the data if you're if you're working in a high dimensional space. So they, they give another interpretation of, of PCA here. Um, and the other, other way of, instead of maximizing variance, the other way to look at it is you're creating surfaces in the future space that are closest to the actual observations. Um, so you're looking for a single dimension of the data that lies as close as possible to all the data points so that it's a good summary of the data, right? Um, you go through that here. So, so that's a, um, yeah, so this is the, the principal components compared to the obs individual observations um, and the components create a surface that is close to those data points as possible. Um, so proportion of variance explained, this is um, again, pretty important for understanding PCA. So it, it, the, the whole idea is condensing the amount of information into a lower dimensional space. So a natural follow-up question to that is how much information are we losing by projecting those observations onto the, the first couple of pieces, the, the first couple of components. Um, so typically, so the first principal component always has always explains the most variance, and then you can look at the at the variance explained by the by the 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 next couple of components as well, or calculate the cumulative variance explained. Oh, it's, uh, I'm thinking the proportional variance explained. Uh, I think uh, we can also use. Uh, the eigen values also. Mm -hmm. Because at times me, I used to make, once I'm looking at the proportional variance explain, I look at uh, those eigen value below, I think below one, they are always contributing less to the principal mm -hmm. component. So those eigen value that are above one, I think they contribute more uh, to the principal component because I also look at eigen. Eigen value when I'm doing my PCA. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, cool. Um, so again, those are going over the point that TCA is, you can either look at it as minimizing the, the, the error um, or maximizing the variance. Again, it's just condensing or extracting the signal from the noise, condensing information into a lower dimensional space. So the yeah, the first component on the US arrest set um, can explain 62%, and the next is 24%, and then you get diminishing returns after those. So they do a screw plot. So again, a proportion of variance explained, one through four. Again, it drops off. The first component always has the most. And then the um, this is the cumulative proportion. So as you as you add components, how much of the total variance are you explaining? Um, so do we go into some of the uh, more specifics on implementation here? Um, so PCA is dependent on the scale of the data. So depending on how you're you're calculating your metrics and how your data is, is observed, you might need to take a different approach. Um, but the general approach is to always scale your, your inputs before you do PCA, unless you have a uh, specific reason not to. Um, but the magnitude of the data does matter. Um, so if one, if one column ranges from zero to a thousand and one, another column ranges from zero to 10, the PCA will think that the zero to a thousand column is more important if you don't scale it because the range is bigger. And here they have an example of scaled versus unscaled. So because these are, these these um these variables have different scales. If you don't scale them, then the assault um, the assault variable um, gets a lot more of the of the of the variance because the magnitude is, is much larger. So but but if your if your data comes measured by it's all the same scale, then you don't need to, to rescale it because it's already done. Um, again, this goes back to the, the exploratory data analysis perspective. Like there's no right answer. There's only local optima, right? It's only good enough. Um, so you can look at the screen plot and sort of eyeball how much of, um, of how many components you need to get a good understanding of the data. Um, but if you're, if you're using PCA in a supervised setting, then you can treat the number of, number of components as a tuning parameter, right? So if you had, you know, 10 components you could choose from, you, you could cross validate your, your regression and try different numbers of components and see which, which one gave the best accuracy. And that's, that, that'd be part of like feature engineering and exploration there. Um, so then they go into um, how you can use PCA to impute missing values, which I thought was cool. And they gave some examples of how that's used in recommendation systems. Um, so this is, again, like you have to understand the data generating process and why the an observation has missing data. If there's a pattern to the missingness, then you, you need to take a different approach. But if it's just random, then this, this might work for you. So again, um, one application is these recommendation systems. 
Um, so I think this is iterative, like you, you, you go through it a couple of times and, and, um, yeah. Okay. So this, this reminds me of, of like random forest a little bit where you're taking a random subset of the data and you're taking a random subset of the variables. Not exactly, but it's maybe a similar idea. Um, so you you take a subset of the observations and the and the and the columns, or you 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 set one of the columns to be missing entirely. Um, and then you then you create the PCA based on that and see how close it was to the actual right. So the imputation versus the actual adherence of the R squared is like sixty four percent, I think, fifty three. Or the correlation, sorry, which, which is which is pretty good, right? So if you if you do it a couple of times, you can you can get the correlation and the standard, standard deviation of that, um, and then you can compare it to the actual. So this is where you could do like a holdout set. You could withhold like ten percent of your data and, and do it this way, um, and again, it's it's so the actual was was about seventy nine. And the imputation method was about 63. So again, it's not perfect, but it's still pretty good. Yeah, so this is um, close related to that validation set approach, like we said earlier. Um, so recommendation systems, they go through one implementation here. So you have a matrix of the customer and the rating that, that they gave for a movie. And each movie has a column. And you can see that, you know, if, you know, if it's a big matrix, but on average, each customer only sees around 200 movies. So most of it will be, will, is going to be missing. Um, but you can use PCA on these, on these columns um, and then impute the missing ratings for all the movies that the customer didn't watch. So I, I thought that was interesting because I would have thought that you would, I guess that's a, that's an unsupervised approach. Maybe a, a supervised way would be to treat it as a um, classification problem. What's the probability that a customer would rate this movie above a three based on the other movies that they've, that they've, that they've rated. Um, but I guess this, this is a unsupervised approach there. So again, you can use the, the, the components to extract groups of, of, of customers and groups of movies. So this can help um, with like product development and things like that. All right, so moving on to clustering. Um, so this is, so PCA was more more continuous and clustering is more categorical. Um, so we're trying to find subgroups in the data set, right? And you want each group to be different from the other groups and very similar within each group. Um, so it's like maximizing the variance between clusters and minimizing it within cluster. Um, so to go through a couple of examples, um, but here's a good here's a good example, a uh, good comparison. So again, PCA is low dimensional representation. You're trying to condense continuous variables down into a lower dimensional space, and clustering is looking for subgroups within that within that within that data set. Um, so one example is market segmentation. So if you have measurements on customers, um, you could use clustering to put them into customer types that don't exist in the real in, in the real world, but could help you with marketing efforts. But again, there's no right answer because um, there's no correct group to put a customer in. Um, so k-means clustering and hierarchical clustering are the two that they go over here. Um, so k-means 
you are telling the algorithm to look for a certain number of clusters. Um, so you know, look for five, look for 10, and divide the observations into those clusters. Um, whereas with hierarchical, you don't know how many observation or clusters you want, um, but you can, it's hierarchical. So you could, you could have it where each observation is, is its own, is in its own cluster, and then go up the tree of that dendrogram to where they're all in the same cluster. And you can look at the tree and cut it at various heights, um, depending on your use case. Um, so I guess you could say that k-means is, is more, the analyst has more influence on how the observations are clustered because you, you can put a constraint on the number of clusters. Um, so they go through all the all the notation and, and, and things like that. Um, so each, each observation belongs to at least one of the clusters and no observation belongs to more than one cluster. That's, that's, that's one of the requirements of the algorithm. Um, so again, we're trying to, to minimize the, vari the variance within each cluster. So, so if you have 10 observations in one cluster, they should all be very similar. Um, so here's here's this data set, the similar data set where you, 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 um, it's setting k equals two for two clusters, k equals three for three clusters and four clusters, and the k-means algorithm is putting the, the observations into the clusters based on the measurement variables. Um, here to me, it looks like two is the appropriate one, is the appropriate number because it, after you get Three and four, it, it's it's sort of inventing clusters that don't you know match my my eye test at least. Um, so they define the the the, the this, this measure of variance as the it's the squared Euclidean distance. So that's the sum of all the all the pairwise squared distances between the observations divided by the total number of observations in that cluster. Um, so again, with, with unsupervised learning, you, you ought to often find a local optimum, um, which is a pretty good solution. It's not perfect. Um, and that's one of the, one of the limitations of, of unsupervised learning in general. Um, so yeah, this is another iterative algorithm. So it runs um, until the objective function stops increasing and you reach that local optimum. Um, and again, this is local, not global. So the initial, the initial um, setting can influence the rest of the, of the algorithm. So you want to run it a couple different, a couple times to smooth, smooth that out. Um, this is a visual of the of the iterative process. Um, so each um, observation starts in its own cluster, and then you calculate the centroids, and you do that over and over and over again until it um, finds the combination that minimizes that variance. But again, you've got to tell how many clusters it should look for. Um, there's no right answer. That's part of the exploratory data analysis process. So again, more more visuals of the of the process. Um, all right, so hierarchical hierarchical clustering um much different approach you don't have to commit to a number of clusters up front um the number of clusters you could say it's continuous because you can cut the tree at various heights 
Um, so this is bottom up clustering here, where you start at the bottom and you fuse the uh, the, the nodes at each level um, to create the clusters. So here's the two dimensional space that we're gonna that we're gonna cluster on. So get yeah. So here it talks about how the the, the leaves, the end nodes, fuse in the branches, and the branches can contain more than one observation. Um, and observations that belong to the same branch are more similar to each other. Um, and then as you move up the tree, you're fusing branches to branches. Um, so the lower down. How do I say it? The earlier the fusions occur, the more similar the observations are. Whereas if, if the fusing happens higher up the tree, then the observations will be quite different. Um, again, so you can look at different, you can you can look at the at the tree and then cut at different heights to um, just depending on your on your prop set. So, so depending on, on the height that you cut it at, you're going to get a different number of clusters. Here we have one cluster, two clusters, you got two branches here, and then three branches here, and three clusters. Um, so it has, it has a lot of content here on, on um, how to interpret these trees, um, basically the y-axis is the only axis that has meaning. X-axis doesn't have any meaning. Um, you can only compare the similarity of observations based on where they're fused. So the x-axis here doesn't, doesn't the distance along the x-axis doesn't, doesn't mean anything. The distance along the y-axis has all the meaning. So again, the uh, the parameter here is the number of clusters. In K means, you can set that as K. That's the number of clusters. In the hierarchical clustering, you can set the number of clusters by the the height that you're cutting the tree at. Again, in practice, you you sort of look at the tree and eyeball it. Based on on the, the specifics of your data and the problem that you're working on, and again, these clusters are um, are nested. So, so this approach sort of assumes that that there's some hierarchical structure in your data, um, but if if there's not, like in this example, there there there's not a there's not a nesting hierarchy in the structure of the data. So if you do a hierarchical clustering, um, the clusters it comes up with will not reflect the data in the real world. So again, it's, it's an iterative algorithm here. Um, so you start at the bottom where each of the observations is in its own cluster. Um, and then you, you fuse um, vertically until all the observations belong to one cluster. Um, so in terms of dissimilarity, because um, one node of the tree could have multiple observations, you need to have a, a measure of dissimilarity that can handle multiple observations. Um, so you have complete, average, single, and centroid, and this is another parameter that the analyst needs to choose to, um, to com complete the algorithm and complete their work. Um, and the, the, 
the, the choice of linkage can have a big effect on on the output of the algorithm. Um, so they got some good definitions here. So complete takes the maximum of the of the dissimilarity. Single takes the minimum or the smallest of the dissimilarities. Average takes the average of the dissimilarities. And then centroid takes the the centroid for the cluster based on the input variables. And each of these will give different different results. Um, they got a good good uh, graph down here. Yeah. So average, complete, and single. Um, single is prone to these sort of trailing lone nodes, um, whereas you get more of a of a hierarchy tree looking thing with the average and complete. Um, but there's no you know right answer. There's no global optimum. It's more about understanding your data set and applying the appropriate approach. Um, so you can do, do Euclidean distance or correlation. Um, either way, to define distance, um, it just depends on the structure of your data. Again, you need to think about the 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 scale and structure of your data and think about whether you're whether or not you should scale your data before you you cluster it um again if, if there's unequal variance in the in the variables then the algorithm will give the, the column with more variance more weight when that might not be the appropriate approach Um, so they go through some of the decisions that you need to make. Um, in the process, um, there's no right answer, but it's more about like finding interesting patterns in the data. Um, interesting question of whether your the, the the clustering actually finds signal, or are you just clustering on the noise? Um, you can do a, you can do like a holdout set and see if, if the algorithm behaves similarly on, on those. Um, but it seems like there's no best practice approach. Um, so these are both hard clustering algorithms where, um, each observation is put into a cluster. And it's you know it's either in a cluster or it's not. Um, whereas like a mixture model um, is interesting because it it it's more of a continuous clustering algorithm um, where it gives you a little bit more of a continuous view of the discrete categories, aka clusters that you're that the algorithm is making. And again, if the if the, the underlying data changes, then the cluster, then the clustering algorithm will give different results. Um, so in this in this case, I guess I guess you could say it's it's um, not highly parameterized, where it really depends on the data on the underlying data. Um, so if you had, so say if you're accumulating data every month. Yeah, you have six months of data on customers, and you cluster them, and you get and you you get five clusters, and, and, and customer A is in cluster one, and then you get six more months of data, and you cluster it again on twelve months. Customer A might be in cluster five, the second time around, because the underlying data changed. Um, again, it's it's not about finding absolute truth because there's no um, there's no response variable. There's no correct answer. 
more about exploratory data analysis and, and developing hypotheses. Um, all right, so that's the content from the chapter. Um, I did have a couple examples, um, two of which I've done. I did this one a couple of years ago, but um, so so you can get um, observations of of birds um, from bird watchers through eBird over an API, and you can see when the bird is you know comes through an area for its migration, or or maybe it's there the entire year, right? You get you get the number of times it was observed for like every week, basically, for the, you know, in this camp, in this case, it was like the past five years and it's very highly seasonal, right? The total number of observations. This is for Pennsylvania. It'll be different in Texas or Georgia. Um, but I, I tried to use k-means to cluster the birds, yeah, to put the birds into clusters based on the frequency of observations per month. Um, so I'll skip down to the, the bottom, but um, so so here on the y-axis is is each individual bird species, and then you know there's like a thousand of them, so I didn't put the names there. And then the x-axis is the observation month. So from January, February, March, all the way to December, and then um, you can see that some species are there year round throughout all the months. Summer are there only in the spring and the fall. Some are there only in the summer. And some show up just very sporadically. Um, so I tried to use k-means to, to put the birds into clusters based on their, their patterns of behavior. Um, so, Again, I, I use some tidyverse code to, to do that, to test out the number of appropriate clusters. And did the, the screen plot there. And again, did some more testing. Um, I, I went with four clusters at the end of it. Um, so again, so cluster one is birds, it ended up being birds that are there the entire year. Cluster two is birds that are only there in the summer. Cluster three is more sporadic birds that just appear, you know, more or less at random. And cluster four are birds that leave during the summer. Um, so that's just one example of, of like a real world application. Um, so I've got some actual species here. Um, so like the morning dove, like here, it's everywhere all the time, right? Whereas um, gnat catchers, hummingbirds, king, king birds, they come through in the summer to breed and then leave. Um, these are rare birds that just come through um, or sporadically, um, and these are birds that are that they are here in the spring and fall, but but leave in the or the yeah in, in the winter, but leave in the summer. Um, one other, um, can you put the code also? Yeah. Maybe you can you share it also in the Slack so that or in the chat here so that everyone can see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll put it. Um, okay. Um, yeah, good idea. Thank you. Um, I also d did um, PCA on census data for the area that I live in in Pittsburgh. Um, so I got some data from the tidy census package and I got some demographic data um, and also information about housing. Um, so we have like the percent of the population that's white, Hispanic, black, Asian, um, the, the total population, and then information about the housing units in the area. So what percent of the total housing units are rented versus owned with a loan? That's kind of 
I'm screwed there. So owned with a mortgage and then owned outright. Um, so maybe they paid the mortgage off and just paid in cash. Um, so, so there's, you know, there's like three or 400 census tracts in, in my County. And I got this, the, the census data and did PCA. And then I took the first two and, and overlaid the original variables on, on top of those. So you can see that, that, um, the area is pretty segregated, um, in terms of race and in terms of, of housing. So, um, a lot of the outlying suburbs are more white and more of the housing units are owned either by mortgage or owned entirely. And more of the, more of the, the urban centers are, have more renters and have more, um, percent of the population that's Asian, Hispanic, or black. So if you're looking for a way to, to use these algorithms, um, test them out yourself, you can get census data from just for your own area and see what it looks like. Um, the other cool thing I found um, is Kyle Walker's website. He does the tidy census package. Um, and he also does a lot of spatial analysis. Um, so he posted a, a blog about how to do Spatial clustering, where it's it's clustering based on in this case it's I think he does demographics on census blocks, um, but he wants to constrain the clusters so that they have to be geographic geographically contiguous. Right? So all the observations in cluster A have to touch physically, like that all have to be connected. Um, so um, he gets the uh, the data. He does the Python, but you can do it in R two. Um, so this is like an interactive graph of all the census blocks in in the area he's working with. And then you can get the, some census data through his package. So the Charlotte population and the non-Hispanic white population. You turn that into a table. Um, and then you can use this Geoda package. This is the Python implementation, but there's also an R one as well. Um, and then it, you can also apply that spatial constraint on the clustering algorithm such that the all the clusters are contiguous within each cluster. Um, so at the end of the yeah, so here he has the final graph where he took those blocks and computed the clusters. And then here he's graphing the, the cluster output. So not the individual blocks, but he's aggregated the, the blocks up to the cluster that they were assigned to. And each cluster is its own geographical area. So I thought that was like an interesting, like next level approach beyond just hierarchical clustering. You're also adding another constraint there. So I'll put I'll put these in the chat as well. Thank you. And then this is the there's a tutorial for RGOTA, which is the package that you can use to do that clustering in, in R. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much uh, for leading the discussion uh, today. I think uh, we meet we meet again uh, next week. Uh, where we'll be looking at the exercise. Really yep. appreciate. See you next week. All right. Thanks. See you. See you. See you.